in your limb lie nations twin, rival races from their birth. One the mastery should gain, the younger over the elder reign. This is taken from the 25th chapter of Genesis. It's the story of the twin, Esau and Jacob. And you might think, as you read it, that here is a woman who gave birth to two boys. And one came first, covered in hair, and then one came out so smooth he had no hair. One was called Esau, and one was called Jacob. That's how it's told. But that is not the story. We are told the first man, Adam, and then the second man, Adam. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The second Adam became a life-giving spirit. It was not the spiritual that was first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. This twin is separated in time between two distinct births, stretching over centuries, thousands of years. Has nothing to do with two little boys who came out within a matter of minutes of each other. This is Esau, this outer garment that I am wearing, and it's covered with hair all over. May not be obvious to the eye, but put it under the microscope, and it's covered with hair all over. The other is smooth, you cannot see him, he is spirit. He is within, he comes second. But he is destined to be the ruler over the first or the elder. This is called the first man, Adam. And what you cannot see, which must be born of everyone, is the second man who is the Lord from heaven. And he is destined to be the ruler. And this which thou seemingly is the ruler will move under compulsion to fulfill every wish, every command of the inner man. These are the two. So in your limb lie nations twain, rival races from their birth. One the mastery shall gain, the younger over the elder race. In a practical sense, here I stand before you, and reason dictates what is right or what is real to me, and my senses confirm it. There is something within that is not born, that must be born, that will take over and not allow reason and senses to dictate what is factual and therefore real and the only reality in my world. I find myself behind the eight ball and I would like to be and I need it but here the outer man tells me it's impossible. It can't be. Yet there's something in me that is screaming for recognition, screaming to be born that it could take over and rule this outer man and actually dictate. That is the second Adam. The second Adam is called Christ in the Bible. The first Adam is whatever your name is that you respond to when it's called, that outer person. That is the first Adam. Now I am here to tell you of both of them. You're quite familiar with the first Adam. The one that you clean in the morning, the one that you feed, the one that, well, you cater to. That is the first Adam. Eventually, the second Adam, 
will be born. He cannot be seen by mortal eye. He cannot be seen even by the mid-level of your being. He is seen only in the depth of being. He is spirit, pure spirit. That being is your own wonderful human imagination. The eternal body of man is the imagination. That is God himself. The divine body, Jesus. We are his members. Because we are his members, one body, you can say this whole vast world is the soliloquy of God. God talking to God. The whole vast world is your self-pushed out. There is nothing but you in the world. Here is this divine unity that reveals itself in multiplicity in, or call it division, in fragmentation. But they're only members of the one body, and that one body, you are. But when you say, you do not say you are, you say I am. Be still and know that I am God, that's the being. Now before this second man is born in you, you can become aware of him, and begin to exercise his power. The power that one day you will completely exercise and consciously exercise. The outer man must serve him. In your body, they are two beings, two races, and they are rival races from their birth. Yet I tell you, one will prevail, one will become the reigning power, and that one comes second. He is the second man who is the Lord from heaven. He doesn't come first. He comes second, and he's completely unknown by the world. But when he comes, you recognize he is your own true identity. You thought yourself prior to this to be the thing that you were wearing, the outer garment covered in hair. When really you are the one hung to sleep within that being. And that one is the Lord of the universe. Now how do I know it? By testing it. I know it from experience. Here I stand in the world and everything is against me. Against what I would like to be. And reason tells me that I could not be what I want to be. Or I could not I'll be very practical. A lady in that audience would like to dispose of a home. It's all hers. It's her home. But they tell her, reason tells her, money is scarce. That you can't possibly find the money because, well, it is expensive to raise money. I'm speaking to her, but to all. She has a home. Maybe you don't have a home. Maybe you have the need of a job. And they'll tell you, jobs are scarce, as they tell her, money is scarce. It's a good home, I know the home. It's in the $80,000 bracket. She could get $75,000 for it now, if she would take it, but she knows it's worth more. They rezone the neighborhood. In fact, I live on the street, so I know it well. And the whole thing is now allowed to go up, well, nine, ten stories, and they're only individual homes now. She wants to unload it, because she lives in one unit, she has two, and hers is eight rooms, and she lives alone. Her son, who has his own home, own apartment, for her sake, he will sleep there, still paying rent where he is in his own place. But just to comfort her, he comes and sleeps there. He doesn't want to do that, and she doesn't want to do that but she rambled in eight rooms. I told her, and I will tell her over and over and over. So they said, how often, Lord, how often must I do it? She said, 70 times seven. 
you cannot sleep in your place physically and in your imagination in that state and still dispose of it. If I would dispose of that home tonight, I would sleep elsewhere, even though I haven't found my permanent or seeming permanent place, for nothing is permanent here. I would still sleep elsewhere in my imagination as though I simply took a vacation having sold. And I thought of the home that my husband built for me. It was the home that he built, now that it is my home. But in spite of all the memories, I have unloaded it. And I think of it. Now this is the secret. When the being within you begins to awake, you realize things are real only as he thinks from a state. Thinking of it doesn't make it real. Thinking from it makes it real. You have to actually think from the state desired and think of the state that you don't want. You can think of it forever, but you must think from what you want in this world. She has to actually sleep this night in a state which allows her to think of the home that she formerly occupied for almost, well, say, going on 18 years, where it was built, it was their home, and now she doesn't own it, she had unloaded it. So she thinks of it and not from it. It's all the difference in the world between thinking from what you want and thinking of what you want. I can think of a state from now to the end of time and never realize it. Let me begin tonight to think from it. Don't ask yourself how it happened, through whom it happened. Just let me think from it. Because the being who is thinking from it is that second man. He has all the power in the world. He is defined in scripture as the power of God and the wisdom of God. He has all that it takes to devise all the means necessary to unload that place in the immediate present if you think from instead of of. I am telling you this from my own personal experience. I am telling you this from my family's experience. I can face an audience no matter how vast it is. I would defy anyone to rise in the audience and tell a story where they were more behind a financial eight ball than my very, very large but perfectly wonderful family. We had no money. We had no one to whom we could turn to borrow money. Fortunately for the family, I did have a father who in some wonderful way stumbled upon this wonderful thing. The only book in this world that he really knew, but really knew, was the Bible. I never saw him open any other book in our house, but he knew the Bible. And in some peculiar way, he actually stumbled upon this secret. My brother Victor, who now runs all the ventures, he stumbled upon it at a very tender age. And they believed it, and they applied it. Their son before birth, because he was not born in them. But before he is born, the thing jumps in the mother's womb. You almost feel its presence. I know in my own case, when my daughter was conceived, and the joy, the fun of putting my hand upon my wife's stomach, and feels life, and something is not yet born, but it's alive, and to feel something kicking there, and it was such fun just to put your head, it, it moved out over here, and moves oneself, and when she would say, He's over here now, forget it, not only he, it's she, I'm telling you, it's a she there. And it's moving all over, because she talked to me. And she gave me her name, she told me all about herself. And this lovely little girl, she's about, oh maybe four or five. A sweet little thing, mass of curls. When she was born, she looked like Gandhi. Not a hair on her head, bad ears, so unlike the child that I saw. For when she was four, she was the embodiment of what I saw to be. And I would put my hand and feel there's something not yet born. Well, you can feel it, may I tell you? You can feel the presence of that something in you. For in your limbs lie nations twain. 
rival races from their birth won the masterish again. The younger or the elder reign. So something in you is being born. It will come out. But it comes out, it is the Jesus Christ of Scripture who is the God of the universe. Now learn to exercise him before he is born. I tell you, you are all imagination. Man is all imagination. And God is man and exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination and that is God himself. The divine body that we call Jesus and we are his members. Because here is one body diversified, a unity in many. So when you look out on the world, the whole vast world is yourself pushed out. And this is only a soliloquy, it's a monologue. So that everything is simply you, and God is talking to God. We are told in scripture, the 42nd Psalm, and deep calls unto deep. It is all within us, so the most, well, the strangest person in the world. And you think you've never seen him before. It's only an aspect of your own being. And in the depth of that being, you are. Or he couldn't even be alive. There's only one God. So the whole vast world is man pushed up. Now, in a simple practical way, you simply, you know what you want? Well, as I said to the lady earlier tonight, you don't have to know exactly where you're going to live tomorrow having sold the house. You'll go any place. You're going to a hotel. Go to a friend's home. Go to any place. But you will not be in a place having sold it. Then you think of your home. When you speak tonight, if you haven't sold it, you're thinking from it. And you're thinking from it as someone who owns that house. You can't go on thinking from it and still desiring to unload it. You must think of it as something you formerly owned. The same thing is true of a job. Tonight, oh, you say, well, I don't have a job. You don't have a job? Well, now stir that being who is not yet born in you, but he is coming to birth. But before he comes to birth, you can feel his presence. Now, how would I do it? I stand here. I see you. I see the room. Can I put myself on the street? Why, certainly I can. I can stand here and assume that I am standing on the street and looking at this lecture. And don't observe this thing at all, called Neville. I am on the street. I can put myself there and think of this and see it empty. Or see it with someone standing here. But I am putting myself elsewhere. Now, you can actually put yourself where you want to be, which when you are there, implies something. The power is in what the thing is implying. If I am sleeping elsewhere and thinking of the home I formerly owned, that implies that I have sold it. It is no longer mine. Now you don't have to compromise. And I'm telling her, don't compromise. You feel the value in what you say it is. All right, put yourself there. And don't let anyone, as friends of hers are telling her, this is short, this is tight, that is so and so. And then maybe your husband is holding on to it. He isn't holding on to it. At their advanced years in life, they're divorced. So what? This happens in this world. After 40 odd years of marriage, he wanted out. And so he got out, leaving his child. They had two, the daughter died, leaving two lovely children. But they're taken care of. There's no problem there. It's not a financial problem. <coughs> and then someone told her, well, you see, he is holding on to it because he built it. Well, it isn't his. Don't let anyone tell you anything. Be still, the 46th Psalm, the 10th verse. Be still and know that I am God. Take that literally. You say, I am, that's God. But as long as the outer man is the reality that you're taking care of, and catering to this one and this one only, totally unaware 
of one who is coming in who is second and the second is going to reign over all that second man will come first he doesn't come first in appearances he comes at the last so the first is physical and not spiritual but when the spiritual comes he will rule over the physical that's what you're told in the 15th chapter of the first chapter or the first letter of Corinthians here there are two distinct beings and the first is only a living being the other is a life giving spirit it gives life to the thing that it occupies it makes it become alive this is only a breathing living organism that's all that it is and so I animate this body when I get up in the morning but there's something in it that just came back from the depth of my own being which was myself my essential being that is the being of whom I speak night after night here last night I said to myself come let us go I'm talking to myself it's a soliloquy I now reveal well all of a sudden my head became the most fantastic vibrant thing and did I travel through eternity what well, all in my head scene after scene after scene and I'm talking to myself I know it's myself but here is my depth the deep of my being and the surface being went for a ride under compulsion I move knowing that I am the very being who is taken over and scene after scene almost impossible to describe the beauties that are in store for all when you actually know that you're one this being within me is the very being called God called Jehovah called the Lord Jesus Christ in scripture the day will come he will actually literally be born and the symbolism of his birth you all know it you will be told in a month from now all the churches will tell it about a little child being born that is not the true story it is you that second man that awakes it is already the reality within you it only awakes and when it awakes you are born from the deep deep sleep which is self involved and although you come after the physical appearance of yourself it was before that the world was you're told it came in after he comes in second smooth skin there so smooth you can't even see him called in the beginning Jacob yes you see the Esau you don't see the Jacob but I'm telling you who that Jacob is and that Jacob is simply a foreshadowing of the one who is coming and coming and coming and finally is born and he is called Jesus which means the Lord is salvation and that Lord who is salvation is your own wonderful human imagination but at that moment it's born and you can trust him implicitly so I stand here put myself in London what's wrong with that well if you have any money you'll say so what does it matter I'm in London and suddenly things will rearrange themselves and I will be compelled whether I can afford the time or the money I'll be compelled to make the journey and it will be perfectly alright it will be done I'm speaking from experience don't treat it lightly because you're going to make the journey and it may not be convenient for you because you're tempting yourself who is the Lord if you have to test it now or you test it and you'll find it will happen at a moment when you least expect it and it is not convenient but you'll go anyway you'll be under compulsion to make the trip do it in your finances what's wrong with money is there anything wrong with having money having enough to pay all your expenses with left over feed the crowd but pick up all the things left over and there are 12 baskets left you didn't start with 12 you started with what two fish and five little barley loaves and you took up all these left over so number of things after you've done it a surplus comes can I tell you live it fully live it to the nth degree you are all imagination tonight you could clothe yourself in anything that you desire I have done it with people who were, whose profession was simply 
Well, the harlot. But I don't care what a person's profession is, so she's a harlot. So what? A friend of mine. Not a cust of mine, not a client of mine, I assure you, but a friend of mine. I don't care what they are. I went to one of the most amusing parties ever given by a very dear close friend of mine who was a lawyer. And he gave it of all night, Christmas Eve. I gave him a huge big copper tray and he had this huge ham on it, an enormous ham. And he invited his clients. He was a criminal lawyer. All the pickpockets in the world were there. And he said to me, tonight everything is easy here. You could put all the diamonds in the world, Neville, in your pocket. Wear them, do anything, not one thing will be taken here tonight under my roof. All these are my clients. They've served time in Paris, in London, in Germany. They've been in all the jails of the world. And I am their lawyer. I get them out. One fellow came to me and he said, and uh, what is your racket? <laughs> I said, I teach the word of God. And he began to smile. One introduced himself to me as Benny the Brahmin. He had about 12 aliases. But this one was Benny the Brahmin at the moment. Something else, five minutes later, he's something else. And one was called the Doctor. Well, it was the most amusing evening, a heavenly evening, and every one was a professional thief and not ashamed of it. That was their concept of life. And I went through this place like a dream. And I wondered, what on earth did Gil do to bring me here? Well, Gil is a friend of mine. And he said, now this would really amuse Neville. And so he invited me this night, and here I came to this party, and everyone had gone through all the jails, not only of our country, but all over Europe. So I am not criticizing anyone. That's their profession, so that's their profession. I am not here to change anyone, but to tell everyone how to use Jesus Christ within them, because the true being within them is Jesus Christ. And he forgives all. He forgives every being in the world. They're all parts played by one being because this is a soliloquy. I'm telling you. The whole thing is a monologue. God is playing all the parts, every part in the world. So he is the accuser and the accused. The thief and the one who was robbed. And no one is robbing anyone but himself. But they don't know it. So here, as I stand here, the being of whom I speak is my own wonderful human imagination. And if tonight I wanted to be other than what I am, or to be thought to possess other than what I do possess, I would not ask anyone's favor, anyone's permission. I would appropriate it. My mood attracts its affinity. It doesn't create what it attracts. For all that's done, the whole thing is done. But it attracts what I assume. So my mood attracts its affinity. So what would the feeling be like if, and then I name it, what would the feeling be like if I were now the man that I would like to be? I catch that mood and it attracts its affinity. Because everything in the world is, I don't care what it is, a tear, it's already done. The laughter is already done. Everything is done. I am only drawing together like a magnet through my mood. So I catch the mood. That's all I'm going to catch. I'm going to catch a mood that would imply that I am already the person that I would like to be. And I sustain that mood. And then it draws it like a magnet and objectifies it on the screen of space. That is the being who is coming into your world. And that being is God. Rearranging the entire structure of his world to outpicture the mood. And he can assume any mood in the world. Now, only two things in scripture, as I can search scripture, this pleases the being of whom I see. And one is lack of faith in I am he. That's the fundamental thing of the world, is to lack faith in I am he. And the second is eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is good and that is evil. But all you have to do is to put yourself in the position of the opponent. 
And what you think is evil, he is thinking is good. And what you think is good, he is thinking is evil. You take a war, if you want to dramatize it, and take, you and I feel as Americans that it was an evil thing that any opponent would try to do to us. And he is thinking that it's evil what we are trying to do to him. Allow Good and evil, the tree of knowledge. Only two things in the entire Bible we are told offends the Lord. And one is lack of faith that I am he. And the second one is the eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now you will have an ethical code, certainly I have an ethical code. And the more I know that the world is myself pushed out, the more I become incapable of hurting myself. I now find the golden rule so easy to abide by. Because I wouldn't want it done to me, and here is my very self. So I can't do it to him because he really isn't another, he's myself. And you start off by thinking, well now would I like it done to me, meaning this little thing. And then suddenly you realize this little thing here isn't confined here, it's the whole vast well. Do not unto others what you would not want them to do unto you. But then the whole vast world becomes yourself and you don't hurt anyone. As he is born in you, you find the whole vast world is one being. And everyone is simply in communication with you because it's, you're talking to yourself. Deep calls upon deep. And God, in a soliloquy, is talking to God. So all things by a law divine in one another's being mingle. Therefore I penetrate you. And therefore all I have to do is to be concerned only with what I want in this world without hurting anyone. And it penetrates every being because of all myself pushed out. And all that can be used to aid the birth of what I'm assuming will be used without their knowledge, without their consent. I don't need their consent. It will all happen, may I tell you. You are the being spoken of in Scripture as the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the being spoken of as God. Begin to believe it. But long before it is born, may I tell you, you can feel it just as I felt the little body jumping in my, mother, my wife's womb. I could put my hand, and if you're married, and you've had a, the joy of being a father, or being the joy of a mother, you know what I'm talking about. When that first little sign of life appears, and then she tells you, I'm pregnant. And then she feels life, and she says, it's kicking me now. And you become curious, and put your hand there. And all of a sudden, there it is. It's a kick. And it's kicking over here. And you go from place to place feeling that little body kicking. It isn't born yet. But there's something in you. May I tell you before this thing happened to me. I used to feel it in my head. Oh, I couldn't tell you. Something actually moving in my head. Something alive was moving in my skull. I could feel it. And then night after night these things would happen. But I would sit down in my silence. And then all of a sudden something is kicking. It's in my head. It was my very self. And then the night that it happened, when I awoke within my own skull to find myself in tomb. But the tomb, which is a tomb, was really the womb out of which I would come. So the second man is the Lord from heaven. And you're told in scripture, heaven is within you. Within and above are the same in scripture. And without and below are the same in scripture. So the first man is from below, from the womb of woman, comes out with hair all over. And the second man is within and his spirit. You can't see him. Not on this level, not on all the other levels, only in the depth of your being. When you see him, he is God. Same structure, that same being, and then humanity gathered together as a single being stands before you. And you know who stands there? It is your son. Humanity symbolized as David. And he calls you father. So this is what I try to get over night after night after night. To tell you before 
the birth takes place, the actual birth, you can feel his presence. And you can prove the power and the wisdom of this being by exercising it. What would the feeling be like were it true that I am now the man that I would like to be? What would it be like? Well then, dare to assume the feeling that it is so, and trust this presence implicitly to make it so, and it does it. No power in the world can stop it. If you have all the opposition in the world, it makes no difference whatsoever. Don't look at opposition, don't look at anything, just simply the aim, and the aim is what you want. It has the wisdom to do it, and the power to do it. If it takes all the things of the world to pull them together, it will, because the whole vast world is intermingled. It will take everyone and pull it together, and make it conform to what is necessary for that which you have assumed that you are to be born in this world. And when you see it, what freedom, what complete relief from this bondage into which we deliberately descended to test our power, to exercise our power, that we could actually enter the world of death and overcome it. Overcome death. And I tell you, the things I could, and yet sometimes it's so embarrassing even to talk about them, because they frighten people who have certain ethical codes, certain moral codes, and they may think I'm encouraging them to go out and violate their own moral code, and I wouldn't want that ever. But what is right and wrong here isn't right and wrong in the depth of your being at all. It's one being. What is right here, wrong here? When you go into the depth of your being, and it's all one grand, wonderful, creative act, it isn't wrong at all. It's sheer ecstasy in the depth of your being. And after he is born within you, your nights become joy, just joy. And you can completely abandon yourself, may I tell you. No fear whatsoever as to consequences. You ask within yourself to take me now. And then all of a sudden it starts in your head. And what a thrill, what a joy is in store for you. Surprise after surprise after surprise. The visions that come. And it's all you. For you are talking to yourself. Be still upon your own bed. And communicate with self. It's called heart in scripture. That's self. And may I tell you, don't be afraid. You will not depart in some violent manner. Others will tell you, you'll go mad, you'll go insane. Or you might burst a bl uh, blood vessel. Don't believe it. Not a thing is going to happen to you. Just let yourself go. If you feel it coming on, don't be afraid. Be not afraid, as you're told. Throughout scripture, don't be afraid. Why? Because the being who's going to do it is yourself. I go to bed in joy, looking forward to the experience of the night, night after night after night. And some things would make no sense whatsoever on this plane, so you don't discuss it. Why talk about it? Because there aren't words even to couch it. How can you close it? It doesn't make sense. And you're only going to disturb. If you do, bring it back. So Paul says, he heard things in that third heaven of his own being that were unlawful to utter. It isn't that they're unlawful to utter, but how would you find words to close them? And how could you in some way describe them that would make sense to the rational mind? So just don't talk about it. You simply leave it just until someone arrives at that point. Then together you can both. But here, on this level, bear in mind, you are now in the presence of two, seeming two, and one is taken over from birth. He was the first Adam. That's the outer man at rational. Now we go to school to become more and more rational. And then comes something stirring within him. He comes last of all. He is the last Adam. And when he comes, he's called the second. 
but the second will reign over the elder, or the first. The first is physical, and the second is spiritual. And the spirit will be born in you, and he will take over completely. And when people tell you it's impossible, you don't even listen to it. As far as you're concerned, nothing is impossible. And you almost stop using the word God, because his name is I Am. Nothing is impossible. To whom? I am. But then, don't take any challenge. You know what you want. And the world will say to you, well, I saw him grow, but he didn't have anything. And I saw him grow, but if you took his history, you would find a most normal, natural unfolding of that picture. And they will trace the means and give all credit to the means employed not knowing that you were dreaming all along and the means simply were drawn by a penalty of their moods and therefore when it outfitted itself they gave all credit to the means employed this one came into your life at the appropriate moment in time and made possible this, that and the other therefore without them you wouldn't have this, that and the other they don't know what you were doing in the sight but you know it's all your soliloquy, your monologue. And because you interpenetrate every being in the world, they had to come when they came to play the part that they played. Because you are faithful to a mood, and the mood simply attracted its affinity. Now this is the inner you. I'm quite sure that all of you have had the feeling of this inner person. And you can get it, and you will get it, before he's born. But you must have had it. Your head begins to feel like a pulsing something, and you see the radiance of that beam. You see the golden liquid light as though you were golden vapor. The whole thing becomes liquid light, and that's you. A center of awareness, and everything is gold, and everything is liquid, and it's pulsing. And you can feel it, long before you have the actual experience of being born from above. So don't think you've got to be born in the way that I've described it in my book in order to exercise his power. No, you'll feel his presence and his power is there long before the actual conscious birth of that being within you. Now try it tonight. Try it every night. Try to live by it. For eventually you're going to live by it anyway. Because not a thing in the world will be impossible to you. Because you'll know who you are. But on this level, everything seems to be impossible. Here I read in this morning's paper, you wouldn't think a DuPont could go broke, could you? Who would think a DuPont? Whose estate runs into billions? That a member of that family could actually go broke. Well, because of his name and his power, he was trusted to the tune of something like 30 or 40 million dollars and then he just declared himself bankrupt a DuPont so everything is possible in this world yes the rich can go broke too and the poor behind the eight ball can become rich too so don't think that anyone or anything is impossible not a thing is impossible those who have it today can lose it today and those who have none can get it today if you know who you are. Now with all of his millions, he hasn't found Christ. He hasn't found him. He was living on the outer man's possession. And that is what reality was. I tell you, let them take the whole vast world from you, but don't let them take the being that is forever, your own wonderful human imagination. Can't take that from you. And that can rebuild everything in the world, no matter what it is. Take it if you will, and I'll rebuild it. You want one coat? Take the other one too. And I'll rebuild it. All by simply assuming that I am the man that I want to be. And friends of yours have lost, but you love them? All right, assume that they have what you know that they would like to have. And then let the thing go. Let them take it. And this is the being of whom I speak. It's a divided being in the early stages. 
but it takes a long span between Esau and Jacob. They didn't come the same night, although you see it in scripture, as two little boys who came out, one holding the heel of the other. And then the little dialogue between the two boys, where the one who came first sold his birthright and sold his blessing to the second one. And you would think these two little boys grew together. These are only symbols. These are symbols of the eternal struggle in the heart of man. And the one that comes out first is physical. He knows nothing but the garment that he's wearing. Then comes the second one. And he comes at the very end of the journey. He's called the second man, the Lord from heaven. But if you take the span between Genesis and the Gospel, you'll find the entire journey. The journey comes to its climax in the Gospel. Yeah.